good morning again from Piper's Persuasion. It's the uh, 29th of April. There's some sort of royal wedding going on somewhere. Hey, nobody's particularly interested because they'd rather watch Piper's Persuasion. And uh, we are in Comber. What is it, County Down, you said? It is County Down. And we're here to see Richard Parks, MBE. And I think there's an MSC in there somewhere. And uh, we'll be speak to him about all that. And very famous man, Pipe Band Circles. Uh, and we'll go right into that history. And also the solo piping history, but more pertinently, how do we prepare to become champion of champions? Lots of tips, hope for, and uh, maybe guidance to many of you people out there. South America, uh, you want to do a grade one championship in the Pacific or whatever, here's what to watch. So sit back and enjoy. Uh, Richard Parks, thanks very much, hey, Richard, for the, having the along at your house here this morning, a beautiful summer's day. I uh, would have loved to have done it outside, but I just don't trust the batteries. So we're sitting in your beautiful house, and uh, thanks for the hospitality. Uh, just to kick off the interview, could you tell us the origins? Uh, who taught you uh, the, way back at the beginning, and uh, pipe band-wise? So lead us into the conversation. Okay, first of all, um, pleasure to be doing this interview, Alan. Uh, you don't have to watch the royal wedding today. So, um, I was originally taught by mainly by a guy called Sandy Cummings. Yeah. Who also had a hand in teaching Harold McAleer and a number of other famous pilots. Harry as well, eh? Yeah, I think he had a, he had a hand in teaching uh -huh. Harry as well. So, um, there, there were a lot of famous pipers that he taught um, around this area. I also had teaching from a guy called John Garrett. Um, uh -huh. and Billy Maxwell from the, 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 the now president of Field March Montgomery and, for, and founder member of the band. Uh -huh. um, so I started off in Raffrey Pipe Band, which yeah. is, um, it was a grade three great, great pipe, three. pipe band then. And Sandy Cummings was pipe major of Raffrey and he was also instructor of Field March Montgomery at the time. So what age were you then? I started when I was nine. Uh -huh. um, and then, for some reason, the guy who gave us a lift to the band wasn't able to go for six months to a year, so, so we're away from it for, for that amount of time. Uh -huh. And then we got back to the band, and I was 10 when I really started at it. So, Sandy Cummings was my main teacher, but also I had instruction from John Garrett and um, uh, Billy Maxwell. Well, they quite uh, adamant about the, the technique. A uh, basic technique of piping, or uh, was it more the musical path they took, or how did they go about it? Oh, I I will never forget the, the teaching from Sandy. I mean, if you if you played a um, a movement wrong, you got to smack it with the fingers <laughs> of the chapter, You got to go away and, and learn it again. You know, aye, so aye. I, I think that's the way it was back then. I think that's yeah. the way all you know was the fear of of the teacher. You had to make sure you had it right, and. Uh, I mean, also the, the the Russells all came through that that, that, uh -huh. that teaching scenario as well, Nat yeah. and Francis and Freddie. And Nat all, as well, all, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. they all come through that. You know, the Billy Maxwell Field Marshal Montgomery yes. setup, and I was sort of part of that because what eventually happened was that um, in Grade Three, Raffrey and Field Marshal didn't have enough players to compete, so they amalgamated to form a band called Fremont. Uh -huh. That's the the last. Uh, the last bit of Raffrey Frey and then the beginning Mont. of Montgomery. So that's, and they competed from around 1973, which is my first experience of uh, competition was 1973. Uh -huh. And they competed for three years under the, 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 the name of Fremont. So, so Sandy Coins was the pipe major then and then the guy called John Garrett and he took over for the last year of that. Okay, so what instrument were you personally playing at that time? What kind of bagpipe was it? I think it was a Hardy bagpipe. It was given to me by the band. The band had, you know, yeah. had, had their own. It was a Hardy chanters that were playing at that time. Um, do I can't really recall that. I think I think they were Hardy chanters because um, the band had an order in for a set of synchro chanters. But yeah, 
at that time it was a three year waiting list in the Singular Challenge or something like that. So we were, I think we were playing these hardies that were pretty well scooped out to, to get the pitch up to close to where, right. where it needed to be. But I think at that time they were hardy challenge. What about blowing? Uh, how did you learn to blow the instrument? Was there any special sort of instruction on this at that particular time, or was that something that came along later on? I think that did come along later on. At that mm -hmm. time, it was just about getting the pipes under your arm and getting a few tunes yeah. up and getting out there and playing. And you know, you got it in the ear if, if you didn't blow right from the pipe uh, major, but you didn't have any any idea what you should be doing. You know, at the end uh, of the day, you know, you didn't. Yeah. Really, at that stage and at that level in grade three, I think the blowing wasn't a big issue. I think no. it was more things that we had to just get, get out and play. play. Yeah. Aye. And what about memorising tunes? Did, I, I, were you always adept at that, or was this something I, again that developed? At the at the beginning, we were taught all the basics of music, uh -huh. um, but initially I I couldn't really understand. I couldn't relate the notes to the music. Yeah. And uh, I actually remember the night that it dawned on me. I was I, I, I used to learn all the tunes by ear first of all. By, you, uh -huh. know, the, you would go around the table, and I would I would be I would be picking up a tune as we were going around the table, so I would, I would be able to play it before anybody before they got to me without uh -huh. the music. Then there was one night I wasn't able to get this tune at all, and I had to actually sit and concentrate on the music. And actually, it just dawned on me one night I can do this, and I was uh -huh. able to follow the music. I, mean, I didn't know all the notes, and uh -huh. you know all the all the embellishments, everything had been taught uh -huh. to me, but I could never relate. The tune to the music, but, but you, you eventually got the sense of the thing on the page. Yes, that's right. Aye, yeah. aye, that's excellent. Uh, so, I think what we'll do now is we'll maybe concentrate on the solo aspect of your piping career just for a few minutes. Um, you went on to win a, a lot of the prizes and the solos, and we'll discuss that in a second. But what was your First sort of a foray into the solo piping uh, uh, thing. How did that come about? Well, there, there's a number of small solo competitions going on in Northern Ireland dur during the winter months. Uh -huh. So I was just taken along to these. I mean, um, both of these guys, uh, Sandy and, and Billy Maxwell, had been solo players themselves, so they knew yep. what was required, and you know, they were teaching me the expression of the two four march, which it was in the, in the juvenile grade back then. It would be a two four march only. No, was that the all Ireland? Um, the, well, there was for, there were other competitions. Other here. competitions, yeah, local Saint, ones. Yeah, there was one called St Patrick's Donagh Moor ran okay. a competition. Uh, you interviewed Sean Fallon yesterday. Yes, I. And um, he was involved in that, and um, that was the first time I ever got a prize. Um, I, I won the juvenile competition when I think it was uh, 13, 1973, and okay. I won that. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was in in um, I didn't get anything in the in the in the juvenile All Ireland. So and then when you became sixteen, you were uh, upgraded into what they called the junior grade. Okay. And the the way that the solo scene worked over here, and I think it still does. But if you win if you win the All Ireland in your grade, you move up to the next. You grade. automatically move up to the yeah, next one. Yeah. yeah, juvenile, junior, and senior back okay. then. Okay. Uh huh. And. Uh, I think my first year in the junior was third. It was a March of Spain read in, in, in the junior. And the first year I was third. And the second year I won the junior. And Duncan uh -huh. Johnson judged that year. Aye. And strangely enough, I played the Nest Pipers as a real that day. I played it round. Aye. So it suited the way. It was just luck for me. I mean, Duncan Johnson would, would have uh, he would have been uh, fond of that style. So, yes. Uh, I managed to win that competition. In, that was 1978. It's funny, isn't it? You, you know the round drills and the pointed drills, and there's some of them. The judges, you just you've got to be lucky that way. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just who's listening to you? Well, if it had been any other judge that day, probably I wouldn't have been uh, in the first three. But I mean, I, I well, certainly, Duncan was judging. Eh? Yes, he was judging. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't even know his style of uh, playing at that great, time. But, uh, but um, I went and played. Mm -hmm. the, I think I heard some. Some band play it, and I uh, liked the tune. I thought, well, I'll learn this for the solos. Uh, but I didn't. I wasn't really getting any real good direction for solos at that time. But you know, and that that got me into the senior grade. Okay. At eighteen, and that was pretty much pretty much you know the earliest you get into the senior, given the system was uh, sixteen, seventeen. Right. So I was in it quite early. So then I needed to look for some sort of instruction. Aye. 
So um, there was a competition over here uh, at that time called the Piper of the Year. Mm -hmm. and it was like a, a three leg event. Yes. It was like a 15 minute uh -huh. performance from each, each competitor. And Jimmy Banks was judging one of the, the competitions. And uh, Nat Russell was at the competition that night and obviously they were having co a conversation and they felt that um, Jimmy felt that I had good potential. Uh -huh. And uh, so Nat knew me and Nat came in and said, you know, Jimmy's uh, he's going to be stationed over here and be, you know, be, be good for you to come and get some lessons from Jimmy. So I managed to get some uh, excellent tuition from Jimmy Banks for about three or four years at that time. And that really set me on the right direction. Uh -huh. Re really, really helpful and, and, and very useful in my, in my career. And you won the paper of a year eight times? I did, yes. Right. So uh, that was a sort of medley. It, well, it, it sort of changed. It started uh -huh. off as like a three-leg competition. Uh -huh. Um, and it was like a, a 12 to 15 minute performance where you had to have like three MSRs in it. So it was quite, it was quite a, quite stiff, a, that, it was quite a stiff competition. Aye, aye. And again it was a three leg competition. So like at the very beginning, I can't remember how many years, but it was three legs for maybe four or five years. So to win the competition you have to be consistent over the three Right legs. through the, the year. Yeah. yeah. That's an unusual form, format of a competition, isn't it? It was. It's changed now. I think it's just, it's just MSR. They have a pee broth now and uh, a hornpipe and jig, so it's, it's, it's a bit less strenuous now. And did you play the pee at that time, no? I learnt a few pee bricks under, under Jimmy. Jimmy uh, teaches Yeah, you he, he taught me a few pee bricks. Um, and I went to the, the, the Northern Ireland Piping and Drumming School, ran courses on pee brick. Great. But I had to make a decision at that time. You, know, you can't do everything. No. And I probably could have done the pee brick. Uh -huh. you know, you know, I'm quite sure that I, that I you know, could have learned it and, and, and gone on and been reasonably successful as a solo yeah. player, but I just had, I had to, 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 to accept that my solo piping career was going to take a back seat to the band, because the band was... You can't, be a, you can't do everything. Well, you can't no, do everything. Unless your name's Bill Livingston or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> or you've got no other life. I mean, you know, you can't... I will. You know, this, yeah. is, this is a big thing, yeah, isn't that, it? Yeah, that, that is. I mean, you've got to have, you've got to have a uh, bit of life balance, you know. And, uh, uh, so you continue in that theme. Hey, you were always obviously studying when you were young and you eventually became a scientist and uh, talk us through that wee phase there that it would have impinged on your piping life and the amount of time you had on it. And I'll come back to the whole island sort of Yes, thing. okay. Um, well, I got a job in, it was Short Brothers at that time, your aerospace manufacturers uh -huh. and uh, components for planes. They actually made their own planes back then as well, like 30 to 36 seaters. Yeah. And have since been taken over but from, by Bombardier from uh, Montreal in Canada, who own, who now own four aerospace companies. That's Shorts, De Havilland, uh -huh. uh, Learjet, and Canada Air. And the whole group uh -huh. is called Bombardier Aerospace. Uh -huh. And they're the third, um, uh, the, the third largest uh, man, uh, aircraft manufacturing company after Boeing and Airbus. And of course they specialise in the smaller aircraft. Yes, they, they specialise uh, in business jets Yes. and also commercial aircraft yeah. and we're developing at the moment a new 100 to 130 seater which is a, a, yeah. a big development and we're making the, the wing, a uh, carbon fibre wing for that in Belfast. So that's a big development that's ongoing. And what's ongoing. your input there? Over the years. Um, well, I started off. Um, I got in after my A levels, uh -huh. so um, I didn't didn't go to university at that stage, and and started off as a lab technician. Uh -huh. And I was became a uh, lab technician for five years, and yeah. then I was looking around because of the experience I had. It's like any company, you get into a company, and you, and you see how, how it operates, and you get to know people. And there were promotions going on at that stage, so. I applied for a promotion to the R and D department. Okay. So, once I got into that department, then um, it was pretty much necessary for me to go on and, and uh, keep gain some more education. So I went to part time to uh, university to do a. Um, I managed to get a, get a, a place on an MSc course uh -huh. on the basis of relevant industrial experience. Okay. So I had to go and set an interview with the um, the the. Um, the teachers uh, at at the 
the university and I dipped through into the into the course on the basis of my industrial experience. Is that so a two year finished. course? It was a two year course but I needed to extend it to, to three years to finish my project because it was yeah. it was a lot of work and because it was part time. It's, it's much easier being a full time student isn't it? Uh, uh, rather than working and studying for a degree. Yeah, it was very Aye. difficult at that time you know because Aye. again I was working all day and I was having to come home prepare stuff for Aye. the band and also uh, do the MSc, Aye. and uh, well, I ended up getting you know a good result in the MSc. I got a, a, dis uh, a distinction in the MSc, so um, I was quite pleased with that result. And that was the last of my study, and I hopefully don't have to do any more. <laughs> but uh, so that went on and gave you a very full professional life, if, uh, and we'll just cover the All Ireland uh, experience where you won the solos seven times mm -hmm. in right. All Ireland. Yeah. Uh, what was the format for that? That was um, it was MSR uh -huh. and submitted two sets. Okay. And um, that was a very important competition. It was the most important competition in Ireland because it was you know the All Ireland and it was yeah. very keenly contested between. Myself and Terry Tully and a, a few a few other people. A, a Big entry. Yeah, I, I remember there being 13, 14 people in the scene. Big enough group. and all, all a very high standard, obviously. Most of the people were living at a very yeah. high standard. Yeah, yeah. well taught and yes. good bagpipes. Yeah, and a, a, a quite a prestigious competition, really. Yeah, I mean you had to be on the money to win that competition. Yeah. And uh, there was a few of us at that time starting to go across to Scotland with a beat just a little bit. Um, Aye. Norman Dawes, myself, Kenny Stewart, right. and Lenny Brown went across on a trip to play at the, uh, the Euston Barra. Yes. When it, when it was an open competition. Aye, when anybody could uh, go into That's it. Right, rather yeah. than an invitational. That's right. Yeah. Is now, sometimes I feel like I straight some of these competitions because a lot of good guys would like to go across and get a tune, you know. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's increasing over the years that you get invited to play rather than you just go and uh, apply and make an entry. However, that's another subject. You were, so you're across cross in Scotland, uh, I'll come back to the Ulster competition in a minute. Uh, how successful were you in Scotland? I got a um, fair few prizes. Um, I mentioned the Houston Barra, and the first time we went, uh, it was just a learning experience, didn't, didn't okay. uh, get anything that year, but I went back, I think it was 1988, uh -huh. and uh, I won the March Answer Spain Reel at the Houston Barra yeah. in the B grade. Uh -huh. Kenny McDonald was judging that day, he judged, um, and Alan Forbes I think were judging uh -huh. the, both the March Answer Spain Reel that day, and I remember there was about two people in the room watching the... What's that's typical, hey, Ken, <laughs> hey, that's typical using Barra. Yeah. But mind you, to be fair, I was at the using Barra this year and there must have been about 80 of an audience and mm. watching the whole thing in the fighting centre. So, yeah. hey, oh, I remember watching the final that day, I mean, there was a lot of people watching the, uh, you know, the, the time. The morning doesn't attract a big audience, in the afternoon they all sort of pour in, you know. Yeah. Um, so was there anything the, else in Scotland? Well, the, the best, probably the best results that I got, I mean, I won the jig uh -huh. at Inverness Aye. and I got a fourth twice then thereafter, so I got a first and two fourths and I got a, a few prizes in the A grade like music, uh -huh. Spain, Raven, March um, and I won the Strachan Memorial MSR in London. In London, yeah, I was going to come to that. Uh -huh. And then I got th I, I think the, the, the year after I won Strachan, that was in the former winners, and I got third in the former winners, and that was probably the best result that I ever got in a sort of top competition. Great. I think Murray Henderson won it that day, um, and I got third. So it was a, that was a good standard competition. Aye, very, very, very high standard there. The, the, the people were playing in it, uh, over the decades. Uh, the Ulster competition, what was that about? You won the nine times you won the yeah. Ulster thing. Yeah, that was that was similar to the All Ireland. It would have been well, it was it tended to be a March and then it's just been and then the you know, uh -huh. overall total the best aggregate won that on the basis of the March and just been There was okay. also a jig competition that didn't figure it in the final result at that time. Yeah. I think nowadays there's a hornpipe and jig, March of Spain and Peter. 
Right, so, so they've expanded that a wee bit. Certainly have, certainly the Peabrook has expanded quite a bit in, in Northern Ireland. Certainly a lot down to the work that the Northern Ireland Pipeman Drumming School has done to bring people across here to teach Peabrook classes. You led me very, very nicely to the next question about the uh, teaching of uh, youngsters in the soul aspect of piping in Ireland. Is it healthy now or is it as healthy as what it was at one time or what's the position with it? Well there's a few really good teachers around um, Northern Ireland um, but I think you know this like of Norman Dodd just teaching people for solos and, and guys that are being taught by him are going on to do quite well. Again, um, I'd like to be able to, to do that, but again, you can't do everything. No. So, you know, you know run uh, a grade one band at the top level. Just uh, it's, get the it's something I'd like to do yeah. in the future. Uh -huh. um, there are other people around, um, names. Freddie Russell used to do a lot. He, he was a brilliant teacher. Uh -huh. was, unfortunately, Freddie's passed on, but um, uh -huh. he did a brilliant job with that. He saw a lot of the young players that are around at the moment. Yeah. And also there's a guy called Tommy Robinson does a, a lot of okay. teaching. I, I hate mentioning names because there are going to be people that I'll forget. Of course, but, so um, you there can, are, there are can't few, mention everybody. No, but there are a few uh -huh. uh, good teachers of, of, uh -huh. of, of piping to a level. I think though, for the guys, I think I experienced this as well. You get to a level by the teaching the, for solos in Northern Ireland, but this, you need to step it up a level in right. the Scotland to actually compete at the highest level. I think everybody who's done that, I mean the like of Alistair Dunn who's going on uh, more yeah. both gold medals, he's being taught, I think Roddy's teaching him Peabrook, so Aye. there is a level that you have to increase yeah. to, to, to go and win the major So they've got to travel a wee bit just to get to the final touches, the, I think the, so, the, yes. the, the teaching thing. Uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, when did it become Field Marshal Montgomery again? It was, uh, as I said, it, it was it competed with Raffrey under Fremont until 1976. Uh -huh. And then the only people that were left from the Raffrey end of the band were myself and Gordon. Yeah. And there was a whole new influx of players, so there was an impetus there to um, change, go back to the, the original Field Marshal and Raffrey, because there was really nothing left of the Raffrey band at that, st uh -huh. at that stage. Myself and Gordon stayed on with Raffrey for the, the for the like of parades and stuff like that, but stayed with Field Marshal for for competitions. And there was a new leadership team come into the band at that stage, a guy called Ricky Newell uh -huh. and a leading drummer called Richard Coffey. Okay. And they were very successful with the band from nineteen seventy six right through to nineteen eighty. Okay. Eighty one was their uh, leadership time. The band won Grade Three. At the World Championships in Hoyk in 1976. Uh huh. They got second at Cowell that year and won the drumming at Cowell in Grade 3 and got promoted into Grade 2. Uh huh. We had a um, pretty successful time in Grade 2. Um, we got second at Cowell twice with that team, uh, the two Richards uh, at the head of the band. I remember being second to Wallace in district one year and the other year was to the RUC. Uh -huh. So strong grade two at that time and we did well. Uh -huh. And then there was a, 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 bit of a, a bit of a falling out within in, in the, the, the band in 1981 and it ended up that um, I was pipe sergeant and the, we had a vote and I was voted in as pipe major in the middle of the, the season in 1981. Okay. So we had eight pipers mm -hmm. that year. In fact, <laughs> I, I, I remember um, we had eight pipers, but one of our eight pipers was going on holiday for the Worlds. Aye. And we had to get a guy back into the band who had played the previous year. Um, a guy called David Hanna. He plays in uh, Open Bay Memorial. But he played. He played in the in our uh, field marshal for for a year, and then I had to call him up to get him to come back to play with us at the Worlds. So that we can actually compete at all. I just got out on the field. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And uh, and I focus, I focus really hard on the sound. I changed some of the music um, to make what we were playing slightly easier, so that we could concentrate on getting a good sound and maintaining the sound throughout. And uh, I do. I remember the week before the Worlds, there was a competition at Portrush, and uh, we had eight pipers right and. The person who was going on holiday wasn't away, they were there, but one of the pipers showed up really late 
Like it was like 15 minutes before we were on the play. Oh, and I had to cut them. <laughs> knowing that if this person didn't take this the right way, we wouldn't be able to go on and play at the words. But I had to make that decision at that uh -huh. time. And this is like one of the decisions you have to make as a pipe major. It was a, a big learning experience for me. Yeah. But I took. I thought the band was going really well. We had a really nice song. I was really pleased with it. And then this guy arrives with this pipe 15 minutes before we go on. And I had to say, to him, sorry, you know, can't, can't do that. And we went on. I think we got fourth at Port Rush that day. But we played, okay. we played quite well. Aye. Anyway, everything worked out okay, you know. Um, the guy realised that it was his fault for, for not, not turning up on time. We managed to get eight pipes together and we went on to Worlds the next week and got second. Fuck yeah, I see. Yeah, and that was an unbelievable result for that band. Because was like, the band was on a knife edge, you can imagine that was like Piper's just, just about hanging in there. Right. If it hadn't got we hadn't got that result, you know, the band would have been wouldn't be here today, wouldn't, wouldn't have continued on. And I always try to remember all the people who were in the band at that time. They were all a part of getting the band to where it is now. Yes. And where I had to make some difficult decisions through the years to improve the standard of player within the band, Aye. I still, I'm still indebted to those people for being part of the band. I know they probably there's some people that were obviously dropped or cut from the band because we're trying to improve the standard right throughout the years, and they yes. probably probably uh, didn't like me very much for, for for what happened. But I hope they feel part of what has happened to the of band. The history it's, of the band, yeah, right. it's, it's very important. Yes, you know, of course are, it is. Right. Part of it. Aye. So you you went on and developed the band. Uh, before we go into hard competition discussion, uh, I'd like to just touch on over the years the, the engagements that the band uh, took on and the concerts and uh, maybe a paragraph and that, you know. Any sort of outstanding engagements abroad and the concerts that you've done. When did you start the concert scene, for instance? Okay, um, really, I started off here. There's, there's the Ulster, the Queen's Folk Festival every winter here, and we managed to get a, a spot at that. And that, that was when we would have been a grade two band, that would have been back in the I would have been pipe majors then, sort of in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. So we would have learned some material for those th those type of engagements, and that got us onto the stage and actually got to know what it felt like to do a concert, you know, the yeah. chat procedure, mm -hmm. um, what you needed to look out for, and stuff like that. Where it, so it was a whole, that was again part of the whole learning experience of what you needed to do for concerts. Selection of tunes. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, these would have been short concerts, you know, maybe do yeah. 15 minutes to half an hour. Then um, also, we we went to the Inter Celtic Festival in Brittany. A great experience. Yes, it's a great ex great experience. Unfortunately for us at that time, if you did that, the the flights that were organised very you couldn't get back for the worlds. So if you did the, the that festival, you couldn't do the worlds. Except That's so it was, Yes, it was. Aye. I think the Scottish bands can get back because they they do boat and coach travel, whereas our, ours were our flights. So the flights never got us back in time to go to the world. So we did that in, I think it was um, 1979, before I took over as pipe major. And then we did it in 82 and 83. So we didn't compete at the Worlds in 80. Okay. Am I right with that? It was around, well, anyway, it was around the, the early uh, 80s. Early 80s. Yeah, early 80s. Early 80s. We, did, we, we got that second in the Worlds uh -huh. in 81. Uh -huh. uh, I think we did compete in the Worlds in 82, and then I think we did the, the festival in uh -huh. 84 or something like that. Yeah. How did we fly from? Was it Cork or was it Belfast? Or it was Cork. Cork across the Rhine or something like yeah, that? Yeah, I think it was. I'm Can't going this year, actually. Are you? Aye, aye. Aye, they've asked me across this year, and uh, because I hope to get uh, Patrick Mallard, Jackie Pansy, uh, Erwin uh, Ropath, so right. uh, I spoke to Tom Johnson, so he's, he'd take me across, I'd take, do a couple of things for him across there, but a okay. uh, marvellous experience, you know. It is. I think uh, things are coming back to me, we flew from Dublin. Right. Not uh, Cork, so we flew from Dublin, and it was a chartered plane, so there was one plane out and one plane back. The so accommodation's you know, a wee bit rough, they tell me, for the bands across. It is, but it's good crack. It's actually, Aye. you know, it's it's Aye. good. You know, you, you form 
uh, relationships with other bands, and you know, we we, we formed a relationship with St. Lawrence O'Toole on one of the on one of those trips back then. Um, so Terry was telling me. Yeah, no, we had, we had a great time with Aye. St. Lawrence O'Toole at that time. Totally different bands. Aye. Myself and Terry are probably the only ones left now. Aye. Both of the bands, but we did form great relationships back then. Aye. I mean, I became a great friend of Terry's from one of those trips. It's very important, isn't it? Yeah, it is indeed. Yeah. Aye. And uh, that's what of the these type of engagements are wonderful for uh, building up a uh, respect and an a mm -hmm. enjoyment of other people's cultures and what have you. So that that was Brittany. Uh, other concerts elsewhere? Um, yeah, we did we did another trip to Kemper and there was a few that was a that was an outdoor festival. There was a few. That's a thing to come well. Uh -huh. Yeah, that would have been in the early 90s then, because remember, uh -huh. we, we did the Camp Air Festival and we had actually won the world the previous year, I think that was, uh -huh. it was maybe 94 or something like that. Okay. So we were starting to build up the, 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 the concert uh, uh -huh. scenario at that time, and then we did the Motherwell concert in 1996. I remember that, fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would have been the first big concert, but we did also, um, just... My memory's not the best now, but we also did a, they used to run the concerts in the Ballymena and um, County Hall. World famous. World famous concerts. Um, I mean, I'll never forget the 78th Fraser Henry one in 1987, that was like the, the, the recorded uh, album of that, which is, uh, you know, um, it's going down in history, but uh, yeah. was at that concert that night, that was very good. Aye. And then we ended up doing that concert in 1991. Okay. Um, and it, we're starting to get material together for that, and we got yeah, we, we got material from various different composers to uh -huh. put together for those, con for uh -huh. those concerts. Who who were your main sort of uh, inputs for compositions, or was it quite a, a wide sort of uh, range of composers? It was a wide range of composers back then, but in the early nineties, uh -huh. when, when we were coming through. There was a guy called Philip Greer in the band who wrote some of our closing hornpipes and okay. very characteristic, what they'd call FM tunes back then, you know, right, like, yeah. um, Duck and Dive and then right. Chasing Shadows, tunes like that. And also we got some slow airs from Marianne McKinnon, yeah. which were, were very melodic tunes. Right. Um, and she also wrote the, she wrote the Steam Train to Mali. Of course she did. And then the Mists of Time, which we played in our uh -huh. uh, first world's winning medley. And, uh, we got a few other tunes from Marianne as well. So uh, there were other composers, uh, William Garrett, who's now on the judging panel, he was in the band back then, he composed a few tunes that we uh -huh. we played at that stage. So although we're still going through a lot of a lot of books to get to get uh -huh. a lot of the lot of the tunes, we played some hornpipes from um Names are escaping me just now. Uh, they'll, they'll come back to me. Uh, there were, I mean, some round horn pipes that we were becoming uh, sort of famous for playing back at that stage in the early nineties. Did you purposely go for a round style uh, when you were selecting tunes, or did you go for a pointed style, or was it was a mix? Or what, what was it, what, where were your influences? Was it the traditional Irish influence, or did you? go towards a Scottish or for, for what was your thinking? At that time it was probably a mix. I remember that we played, let's take our, our first World Championship winning medley, we played, a, um, it was a, a, a pretty pretty round opening tune, uh -huh. it was called The Power Driver by Robert McVeigh. Okay. Um, and we played three parts of that, but it wasn't totally round. There was a few areas in it that were slightly pointed, so it wasn't a totally round tune. Giving you a contrast. Yes, there was. Um, and we played also a pointed reel uh -huh. at that stage. Um, but it, we played a, uh, that hornpipe as an opener, and then a couple of just bays, and then a pointed reel. Okay. And slower jigs, and then do a pointed hornpipe to finish. Um, the influence for that probably came from me just listening around to what was going on at that time with the, with the top class solo players that were playing in kitchen piping style, playing round tunes. Okay. Um, the seventy eight Frasers were probably were, were, were starting to play round tunes, so the, the were yeah. influences there um, that were coming through, but also the Strathclyde Police were, you know, straight down the middle, you know, pointed tunes and very impressive. Aye. So we had to keep some of that in there as well. You know, so we tried to, to create a balance at that stage. Because Strathclyde Place in the 80s, that, that was a band. 
uh, to be listening to. Absolutely, very, very, very much so. I mean, they, they would have been my heroes back then, listening to that band, Aye. the sound that they produced. Aye. You know, and the, 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 the tightness of the playing and the execution and the expression was just second to none and would stand up in, in today's competitions as well. So, did you have any conversations with Ian over the years? Uh, Ian probably doesn't remember them, but I did have a conversation. <laughs> and I remember having conversations Aye. with Bill Livingston and Terry Lee as well, but they probably don't remember me back then because I would have been a young, reasonably young uh, pipe major in learning at that stage. You know, that was prior to the band becoming yeah. more famous in Grade 1. But certainly I had conversations with Ian. Um, and there's a few things that he told me that I've taken on and, and used. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's not, not, not secrets, but just, you know, if you're setting up the chanter, you know, it's probably best to set your D and F so slightly on the flat side rather than being right on the money with your D and F. Uh -huh. you know, it's, more, it's more easy to get stability in the note if you can, if yeah. you can do that. I mean, that's not <coughs> a secret. I mean, Broader people, sound. Yeah, slightly on, just slightly yeah. on, the, on the F and the D. Uh -huh. Um, I've found sometimes you can go too much that way and you have to come back and say you can't go too much that way so you know, there are, I mean, there are, you're always learning all the time and, and, uh, but there have been, have been things that I have learned from, from some of the masters that are did, there. Did you ever go eh, with the synthetic bags that are you always been sheepskin? <coughs> we did experiment with the <coughs> synthetic bags. It would have been Probably in the in the mid nineties, mm -hmm. we and we didn't ever go with the whole way synthetic bag. We we had a few people play the synthetic bag. And what I did find was that it was okay in the indoor uh, scenario where all the conditions were the same. But we yeah. go outside and you get various weather conditions. Aye. It didn't work at all. The people playing the synthetic bags and the sheepskin bags it wouldn't, wouldn't work at all. So and it ended up just in one or the other. So. We went with the sheepskin, but I think we tried that for one year and, and ended up going fully sheepskin then um, at all at all stages. And probably the drone reads is synthetic or cane? Mainly, mainly cane. Um, there are a few synthetic uh -huh. reads in, in the band. I mean, it, you know, especially I always tell people to have a spare synthetic bass drone read in case their, their bass drone gives them trouble on the day so they can just Aye. pop it in. At the Especially last if it's raining. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, if people's, you, you never know when your bass drone is going to start double toning or whatever and it can unsettle people uh, very easily. So always try Aye. to ensure that somebody has a synthetic bass that they know doesn't double tone. Uh, so they can just stick in uh, with 15 minutes to go and it'll work okay. It's so really important for confidence, isn't it? It is indeed. And the guy, like I am very, very strict with regard to introductions at BAN. Uh -huh. practice and I always tell people if you know practice 30 introductions a night and if you miss one then you need to get rid of that bass drone read because it's not going to work right you know that that one time is when you're on the line that Aye. one time is when you know you know it'll if it's five percent doubt then it magnifies doesn't it absolutely so, <laughs> I'm, I'm always that Aye. way myself I'll practice striking the bag 30 times every time Aye. I practice and if the bass drone, and you might have the most steady bass drone, and it must, you, might, you might love the read and say, oh, I don't want to get rid of this, but you've got to be realistic. You've got brittle, it. Aye. Yeah. Aye. At, uh, the chanters over the years, uh, I suppose you had different chanters that you played as pipe major over the last 30 years. So what uh, instruments and over the years did you play the chanters? We, when I took over, uh, we had a set of Sinclair. Chander, um, and I, I, I like I like the Chander worked worked really well. But what I did find was with the, the weaker players in the band that there was always a problem with chirping from high A to low A on the second Chander more more uh, more than any other, mm -hmm. well, more than a synthetic Chander, not yep. more than any other Chander. But certainly the sound from the Sinclair was a great sound. Right. But towards the end of the eighties, uh, David Chesney uh, joined the band, and he. I was playing his own chanter and I started experimenting with those chanters and I, for me at that time I was getting pretty much the same sound from those chanters and the problem with the, the high idle away had gone away so for the weaker players at that stage it was to, to me it was more uh, a chanter that was more uh, more likely not to give us problems with chirping or squealing aye, aye. and uh, 
So we decided to go with those. So and cut, cut out another variable, really. Yes, yeah, that was it. I mean, I, um, and I was getting, David Chesney was in the band at that time, and I was getting uh, the pick of the, the, the reeds and, and, and the chanters, and we had a very successful uh, sound with the, 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 they were the Warnock chanters made by David Ch Chesney and uh, the Warnock reeds. So we, uh, we won two world championships with that setup. Okay. And we're very consistent at that stage in the early early nineties up until. What was the first uh, year you won the world championship? That was nineteen ninety two. Okay. It was the first year. So you took over directly from Strathclyde Police that day, that last winning. That's won right. in ninety one, right. I think. That's right. Yeah. And so you moved in at that point, and. Yeah, was the way it worked for us was in nineteen ninety. Uh huh. We we played really well. All season long, and that was when we first got into the prize list. Uh huh. And um, we got fifth at the British that year in, in Bathgate, and uh, we progressed, played really well all that season, and we played really, played really solidly at the Worlds, and we're very early, and we got fourth at the Worlds, and we were over the moon with that result. That was uh -huh. the, a, a big result for us, and then we won Kyle that year. Yeah. Um. So that that was just an unbelievable experience walking down the uh -huh. uh, with the Argyle Shield down the uh, streets of it's down, that was that was a brilliant experience, one never to be forgotten. Um the next year, nineteen ninety one, uh, we placed highly in all the majors. Um we didn't win any majors in nineteen ninety one. Mm -hmm. I think the highest we got that year was third. So slight that was a slightly on Slightly disappointing year for us because you know we'd won Kyle that pre in nineteen ninety. Yeah. So we, we had a really hard season, winter's practice in the nineteen ninety one season and come out and we won the first major at Stranar. Okay. I can't remember what what uh, championship it was, but we won Stranar. And then we won at Inverness that year as well. And then the the week before the Worlds it was um, was that? Dunblane? No, it wasn't Dunblane. Our broth, I think it was our broth. Aye, and, okay. and Strathclyde won at our broth. Uh -huh. And uh, obviously that's where the main challenge was going to come from for the Worlds that year. So um, the next the next week was the Worlds. And it was that was a terrible rainy day. It rained Aye. that whole day. Aye. And I remember we had a practice on the Friday at, at uh, Glasgow Green. No, it wasn't Glasgow Green. It was uh, Bella Houston Park. That was in right? Couldn't get two chanters together at all. The sound was really poor that, that, that day. We just ended up putting, putting the pipes in the box. I said, look, look, we'll work on it tomorrow. And of course, tomorrow was a wet day. I mean, we're not going to be able to work on this. But as soon as we took the pipes out of the box, it was just the, the sound was there right away. It was just one of those... It's amazing, yeah? Well, yeah, it was just one of those things. You'll never understand bagpipes, but that's Aye. just the way it worked that day. Um, didn't hardly have to touch a chanter that day. and. Uh, well, we went on. We didn't get one first that day from any of the judges, uh, but it was all seconds, thirds. So fourths. it was the aggregate that it got the aggregate that got us the uh -huh. the, the words that day. I think we won the medley that day. Uh huh. Um, and Strathclyde won the MSR, but there was no separate prizes at that time for medley or yeah. MSR. They just read out the first, yeah. first prize. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first words, and that was just. So that was under the, the, the Chesney system. And was, yeah. Did you change chanters over the years after that? Yeah, we changed chanters um, towards the end of the, I think it was 1998. Um, the pitch was starting to go up at that stage. Yeah. And I just did, I just felt that um, I wasn't able to get the pitch with the, with the, with the chanters at that stage. Uh -huh. So I thought that we needed to, to change to see if we could get someone that would be more more consistent at that higher pitch. Uh -huh. So we changed to the Shepherd Champions at that time. I tried a number of champions, I tried everything that was out there at that, that stage. You know? yeah. And I liked what I was getting from the, the Shepherd Champions at that, at that stage. And that's As I said before, we started off, I had singular champions in the band, playing the Warnock Reeds, and then when David Chesney joined the band, um, I found that we were getting less problems from high to low A, not getting any chirps or any, anything with, with that chanter, and that's when we decided to go with the the uh, 
the war at Chandler that time made by Dickie Chesney and the band were very successful in the 90s winning two world championships in 92 and 93 and then um, I think I explained before that when the pitch started to go up towards the end of the 90s I felt that we needed a channel to be a bit more robust in terms of managing to get that pitch which I didn't think at that stage the Warren Chandler was more suited to the pitch that we played in the early, in the early 90s and we've experimented with reeds. That's the same channel that we have now. We have experimented with reeds over the years. We've had um, the the Shepherd reed, the McGarry Ross, and then the Ross reed, and uh, and now I'm, I'm, I'm using the, the Warnock reed as well. Uh -huh. Chanter. I mean, the, the, it's good reed, good chanter. The, the, yeah. The, I mean, a good reed will work in any chanter if it's a good chanter. And they're getting stability. I'm getting stability at the, at the moment, yes, with, with, yeah. with what we're using, so um, hopefully we can continue on. And it's still, you're still going at a fairly high pitch, yeah? It is a fairly high pitch, but it, we're at a fairly high pitch because the top level bands are all at a fairly high pitch. Of course, yeah. The, the, the pitch all, is high. I mix, uh, the one, uh, the, the, the one of the same, really, aren't they? It's hard to explain how it's got there. I, and I, I, I just feel... I think everybody's ears are going that way. Yeah, I think it's it's been a progression. It's been a, a, a relative progression. If you listen back now to the pitch we were at in 1992, you, it sounds so flat, it's unbelievable. It's just... Stressed out place as well. Yeah, right? I know and that. The, all yeah. the recordings. Like, yeah, it's just a different world. Really. It, it is a different world. And I think what bands have always done to try and get a slight edge every year is just come out with that wee bit higher in pitch. And it sort of pricks your ears up. Aye. And it just seems to be that every year there's been a band that's come out slightly higher pitch, slightly higher pitch, and then we've just got this stage now where it's... It it's the high be. A's now that are really very, very clean and there's no flatness about them at all. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a pitch right up there. Yeah, it's, it really can't go any higher. You know? <laughs> it's got to start going the other way, but again that yeah. can only happen gradually because if, everybody, if somebody comes out with a flat sound, even if it's perfectly in tune, right. it's going to be so far away from what... The, 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 the judges are not getting my listen probably. I, I, I think they're struggling a wee bit. I think everybody would be too frightened to go that way, you know. Aye. Um, so I, I think it's got there by virtue of the fact that, that bands have tr always tried to give themselves an edge in terms of, of, of getting that pitch. I'm going to come back to a lot of that just a, a, a shortly, but. I think we'll just continue in the, the prize winning theme at the moment because, for instance, uh, you've won a very large number of major competitions in the last 30 years since you've uh, become pipe major. Something like 60 odd majors, is that correct? No, it's 43. Yeah. 43, yes. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it is 60 odd. <laughs> no. But uh, it's still a very, very large number of uh, majors. That's first prizes. Yes. Yes. First prize. Maybe I was thinking about other prizes as well, I don't know. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, how many times have you won the world, then? Six. Six times? Yes. And the champion of champions? Nine times. That's wonderful, that. Yeah. That's extremely hard. That's probably uh, just as hard, if not harder, to win in the world because there's a consistency across the season demanded there. No, absolutely. It, it, it is harder to win. But I mean, the world's again is a different scenario when you've got Aye. overseas bands coming in. You've got, you know, yeah. you've got you know, maybe a higher level of competition of course. than you have at all. Yeah. But still, you have to maintain that consistency through the, the five major championships yeah. to, 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 win, to win the champion champions. Okay, in order to do all that, there's a, a lot of preparation. So, getting back to basics here, how uh, do you recruit and select your players, pipers and drummers? Well, um, if, a, if a, a piper wants to, to come and join the band, they need to do an audition. Mm -hmm. Either with myself or with Alistair Dunn and my pipe sergeant who's based in Glasgow. So. That's the way it happens. They do an addition and we see if they've got the ability to, to play the tunes and, and, and they've got the blowing. So it's a one on one on pipes. Right. So we'll give them some of the MSRs to go away and learn and then they'll come and do an addition with us. Uh -huh. And we'll make an assessment as to whether they, they can fit in the band. And obviously, there's 
issues with personality, well, well fit in of course within the the, 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 the band membership and stuff uh, like that. So the personality skills and that sort of thing. But the, the bowling is very, very high up in the list, isn't it? It's at the top of the list. I mean, you, you can get away with, with somebody who has got good fingers, uh -huh. uh, as opposed to somebody who's got brilliant fingers, but doesn't uh -huh. have the, the, the blowing technique. Yeah. Um, the blowing is, is most important. I mean, uh -huh. season sound start to finish is ultimately important in a, in a pipe band. On the this, I've got a thing about blowing myself, but do you find, or did you find in the past, that you won't find it now, I know, because uh, of your emphasis on blowing, but in the past, in the early days, did you find that uh, pipers were blowing harder uh, when were playing hard tunes like jigs and horn pipes or competition pieces than when they were playing three, fours or six, eights? Did you find a difference in the blowing? Um, what I found would be that if if the uh, if the players aren't comfortable with the tunes, uh -huh. they the the blowing tends to suffer. If, if if the person's comfortable playing the tune, then they can blow and they can blow in a natural in, in their natural format and, and be steady with blowing. So possibly if you're playing a, a three four or a six eight and you're comfortable with the tune, you maybe blow a bit harder and, and more comfortable. When you're on the the jig and you may be just scared of the tune and you're maybe backing off a wee bit, so that that can be the issue. So really, uh -huh. people need to be they need to be sure that that, that they're that, that they've got total mastery of the tune before they can they can fully be confident in the, the yeah. blowing aspect. So does a dragon kick in a competition scene where they maybe blow that wee bit harder at all? That can happen, but you've got to try and prepare people for that. And I think you know, how do you do that? Well, I think I'm quite strict at the, the, the band practice and I think if people can get through a band practice with me, you walk in there and listen to them and I, I think if through a, a practice with me, they can get through a competition. I uh -huh. think they're probably as scared of the band practices as they are at a competition. Ah, well, that's the thing. Uh, uh, excellent. So that covers the blowing and the selection of uh, the, the, the people. Uh, the next thing you come to is the selection of the tunes, isn't it? So how do you select tunes for a competition? It's getting very, very difficult now as the, as the years to go on to, to produce medleys that um, have got anything new or or something which is traditional but you can give it a new twist. To yeah. It. So, it, and the more good medleys produced, the harder it is to produce another one. You know, so you're always looking for new ideas or. Um, you be listening to folk bands, you'll be listening to a lot of music out there and seeing what you can hear to see what if that will work with the band or, or, or you know, if it'll work with a drum corps, if if, if you see it working uh, within a, a, a band medley. So uh -huh. obviously there, there are great composers out there. I mean, there's the like of Ryan Canning with in our band who produces tunes which are excellent melodic tunes and uh, quite often uh, they will find their way into your medleys. Um, so, you know, you're looking for new tunes from new composers and also looking for traditional tunes played in a slightly different way so that you can get a mix of new ideas, new tunes with old traditional tunes to, to try and keep to keep the listener interested on the first listen because it's very important. Well, that was, I was going to ask you about the impact and the judges. Uh, I think you, you must select the tunes for that, yeah? You have to. I think you have to select tunes that the judges can connect with on the first listen. Yeah. Because they a lot of the times the judges are hearing it once and that's it. Right. And uh, quite often if a band plays a medley a second year, then the judges know the medley, they know the bits they like, they know the bits they, they, they don't like. Um, but if you're playing a medley the first time, it's you, maybe the first time that the judge is, is going to hear it and they need to be able to relate to the tunes. So everything too new in a medley, I think, doesn't work. So it's got to have something with a bit of new and a bit of traditional and just a good mix. And give them a good balance. listen with the first tune, eh? Yes, very much so, yeah. Aye. Right, so we've got the, the people, we've got the tunes. We go to a band practice, how do we prepare uh, for the season with the band practices over winter? Is it uh, practice chanters or is it pipes or what is it? Well, first of all, now, now it, it works different now than it did when I first took over the band. When I first took over the, over the band, 
there was lesser quality players in the band, so we were full band practice right from um, October right through. Full band practice, on practice channels, then on pipes, playing the tunes. But nowadays I've got much more high quality players, so they need to be handled totally differently. And I think people need a break. At the end, of, after a very hard season, people need a break. So yeah. basically we'll take a couple of months off and I'll start looking for tunes and get people to send me tunes, go through a lot of, go through a lot of music. And nowadays it'll all be emailed out to people and recordings of the tunes will be yeah. emailed to people and the, the, the music will be emailed to people. So when they come, we generally have our first practice and it will be the start of January. So the, the, the guys will have all the music and they, they, will, they will be expected to come to the practice having a good handle on, on the tunes at that stage. So we'll, we'll be practice chanters for, for, the first, for the first month or so, but the way we work it now is because we've got a number of pipers in Glasgow and a number of pipers here, we have like strategic practices at the end of January, February, March, and then in April we'll have a couple of practices. So the January practice will always be on the practice chanters, and then February practice will be on pipes. Okay. And then it'll be all pipes from there on. Yeah. And the, the funding of the band uh, for all these uh, the two drawings, is that self-funded by the individuals, uh, the individual papers? Or, uh, yeah. Do they pay their own airfares and that sort of thing? Yes, it is all self-funded for the yeah. pipers and drummers. Uh, all all self-funded. Um, we do get sponsorship from uh, R.G. Hardy for our, our uniforms, uh -huh. uh, which, which is very helpful, but um, it, all, the, all the travel is self-funded. Okay, we've done the practice during the winter, we got off the bus at the competition. Where do we go? What do we do? Well, from a pipe perspective, what we'll, we'll all do, we get off the bus, I tell them all to go and blow their pipes for a couple of minutes just to make sure that, that nothing's happened happen during the travelling experience that uh, no pipes have been, no drone reads have fallen in the bags, check all your drone reads, check the chanter reads in tight, you know, just the basics, just to make sure your chanter reads in solid, the chanter reads got an in. Yes, and it's not <laughs> going to fail on you, right. which has happened to me in the past, but um, uh, generally we, we get a bit of check that all the reeds are in place and give your pipes a blow and make sure they're okay. So we'll do that at the beginning uh, just to make sure everything's fine. And then probably two hours before we play, then I'll get a bit of blow pipes again for a bit longer this time, for maybe four or five minutes, to allow some moisture to get into the reeds so that the, the pipes have had a chance to stabilise. Right. And then probably just over an hour before the, the competition, uh, we're going to to play in the competition and get all the papers together to, to play a tune together at that stage. And then it'll be full on tuning from that stage to until, until we go on. Now who tunes what? Well, again that's different now to what it was in the early days. What, what, when, when I started off, I did everything. Tune the drones, tune the chanters. And right up until 2000, when we had 17 papers, I did everything. Uh -huh. But it was just too much. I just couldn't do it. That. Couldn't do it. My, yeah. I mean, my pitch was so flat when I came back to the man yeah, and tuned the band up. It just didn't work. So, um, we've now got Frank Andrews in to, 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 to be our main drone tuner. We have other people who help out, but Frank is the main drone tuner, which is, and he's a great assistance to me on the day of a competition. Um, it's not just about using the meter, it's about using your ear as well. Uh, and uh, Frank is, is excellent with that. He's uh, just a, a great, great one band himself. And knows what's good and is, is able to, to feed stuff back to me. And he's going to learn the instruments as well. Mm, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Mm. And that's one thing I know everybody in the band, they know how they all blow and uh, the type of reeds that they different take. Different type of bagpipe uh, that goes around and you'll know how that bagpipe's going to react with yeah. drones wise. Uh. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. do you do all the chanters yourself? No, there's, we, we split the chanters up now. There's myself, Alistair Dunn, and Mark Fallon. We, we would tune Great. the three of us would, would, would tune the chanters. So we take Pretty much if there's 23, 24 players in the band, we'll just you take each. Right. And we all, we all have, what I've, what I've tried to do the last couple of years is everybody knows who they're going to be going to, so there's no confusion. Yeah. So everybody knows who they're doing. So what, you know, people are positioned in the band in such a, a, a position that they know who, who's going to tune them up. Yeah. So first of all, I would make sure that our three chanters are in full unison and, and we're up to, to, to full pitch before we go ahead. That's very important to, to do that. Right? 
bad weather comes in, showers of rain and stuff like that, and some days pipes are starting to feel uh, much effort to be put in the last five minutes into getting that set ready for a line, or what do you do? Well, it, it, it will depend. I mean, if, if it's like we spend a lot of the time at practice tuning up. So generally, when you get to the competition, you don't have a lot of work to do. Generally, the, the sound will generally be there when we get there. Yeah. And if some of these pipes are starting to fail, well, it'll just be you know, obviously you'll, you'll try, but if, if you're short for time, you'll just say you, know, you may have to. Yeah. At that stage, you might have to cut somebody if, if their pipes aren't up to the, yeah. the mark on the day of a competition. Yeah. And they've been professional enough to know themselves anyway. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you're, you're sitting with 20, Aye. 24, 25 pipers, maybe Aye. one or two. It's not going to make any difference at all. That's wonderful. And great success over the years, uh, which was uh, recognised, I think, 2004 with the MBE. Yes, that was a. What was the circumstances with that? Well, it was actually just that. I had a stroke in the, the early part of 2004. It was when I was recovering from that that I got the letter to say that it had been uh, put forward for, and been accepted for an MBE. Everybody accepted it. It was an unbelievable experience. And obviously, uh, somebody had been writing in to, on, on my behalf o over the years to, yeah. to try and give them a, a background to, to what I'd uh, been doing in Northern Ireland for pipe bands. And because I was the only person in Northern Ireland to have. Uh, had the success that I've had and won the World Championship that uh, was put on the basis that I was from outside Scotland in Northern Ireland and the work that I'd done to, uh -huh. to, to achieve the success that the band ha had had had, um, had had got at that stage that um, Where did you go? We went to the palace. And who did you see? It was the Queen. Was ah, the Queen? great. The Queen presented it, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll not ask you what you say because <laughs> <laughs> you're not supposed to ask that question. But a uh, very pleasant experience. It was an unbelievable experience. Uh, was, uh, who went with you then? My wife and my mother went with me too. Uh -huh. uh, and it was an excellent day. We went to the, the Ritz afterwards for lunch. It was a, you had a nice time there. It was eh? an excellent day. A excellent wonderful day. Uh, uh, cap to recognising your. your uh, extraordinary efforts and expertise over the years and thanks very much Richard for this interview today. It's very kind of you to give all of your time and I'm quite sure people throughout the world watching this so learn quite a bit from it and thanks again. Well maybe when I uh, eventually retire you'll, you'll get the chance to come back and do another interview. And another 50 years eh? <laughs> <laughs> thanks Richard.